Look into the Word of God, Ephesians, chapter number 5. If we would turn to the Word of God, how many came ready to hear God's Word? I know this morning that uh, we are prepared. We had a wonderful worship service, and uh, God, we elevated the name of Jesus Christ, and, you know, we, we took that time uh, that God has given us to worship and to thank Him, and that's so critical because when you read in the Old Testament, there was also wor always Worship and praise uh, that led the army of the Lord into battle. And that worship and praise brought them success and victory. And you and I have victory here this morning. I really believe that. Now, I know this morning that I probably am going to be preaching to the choir. And what that means is that what I want to do is reinvigorate, if I could use that word, refresh uh, some of your commitments uh, to, the, to, to God's purpose for your life. I, I want to uh, bring a challenge that if maybe you are wavering uh, in, in any, uh, any area of your life, that uh, God would give you wisdom and understanding as to how to get back on track. Because, you know, over a period of time, uh, we have a tendency to kind of just pull back on the throttle and, and put it into cruise and, and, and be just begin to live our daily lives as, as uh, we go on. But uh, we need to make sure that as we are moving in, in, in life, that we stay on course and that uh, we are, uh, are accomplishing God's will and purpose for not only us, but what he saved us for, and that's to influence society, to influence our world. The Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints, were influencing an influence to those around them. And that's why we're saved. That's why we're born again. Yes, we want a better life. Yes, we want God to bless us. But yet, he does that so we can help others, so we can teach others. That's the whole point of Christianity. How many can say amen to that? And in saying that, we're, we're aware that, uh, as, as I was listening this morning to, to a news account, uh, Franklin Graham was talking about the decline in church attendance. And he was talking about how it seems that less and less people are attending church nowadays. And there are so, a myriad of reasons why that's happening, why that's taking place, why people aren't actually physically coming to church. Yes, some are staying home and now watching online, but uh, what, he, what, what was being said that there is uh, unfortunately a lack of evangelism and, and a lack of getting the word out to get new people to come in. Because how many know in our communities, in our families, there are, are so many people that need Jesus. So many people need salvation, need to hear the good news of a risen Savior. And it's up to you and I to get that out. And, you know, as I was thinking about this sermon, and, and uh, you know, I was going to preach a message uh, I had prepared for this uh, uh, Sunday, but um, Brother Manny uh, preached a tremendous sermon on Wednesday night. And, I mean, he tore my sermon apart. He used every point. He got into every aspect, and that's what happens when, you, when, when you're ministering the Word of God, you know. There you come. We never share with each other a lot of times uh, what, especially on Sunday, what's going to be preached. And so uh, what I did was I spent time uh, going through the Word of God and praying about uh, what God has impressed on me and um, looking at, at the issues in society and what's going on and the pressures upon uh, what I want to call the family, the strategies against you and I. Uh, and when I say you and I, I'm talking about men, you and I as men, that we have to face every single day. Uh, that's a strategy of the enemy that keeps people from church, that if we make the wrong choices and, and don't stand firm in what God's Word says, then there will be, obviously, a decline, not only in church attendance, but yet in getting the word out uh, to people around. Men, we know that they're going through all kinds of pressures in our society today that in past generations they've never had to deal with. The job pressures, the economy, 
more pressure to provide for families that unfortunately may be, be, be keeping people from attending church or cause them to be distracted in other ways to begin to focus on things outside of church rather than serving in the kingdom of God. And again, I know I may be speaking to uh, the choir, but I want to refresh our commitments and refresh what God says needs to be priorities in our lives. I read a survey, and it was a secular survey. It wasn't a Christian survey, but it was a survey put out by, by um, uh, an institution. It said one of the six components of a strong family is spiritual health. The spiritual health of that family is one of the components that causes a family to flourish and causes a family to be uh, blessed and, and prosperous in society. And it went on to talk about another survey that showed that faithful parents produce faithful children. Faithful parents produce faithful children. It revealed, and this uh, survey went on, and it, it was, this one was a Christian survey, revealed that if the mother and father both attend church regularly, 72% of their children will be faithful attenders to church as adults. If only the dad attends regularly, listen, 55% will remain faithful. If only the mom attends regularly, only 15% will remain faithful. You see the disparity there? For the man, 55% of kids will be continue coming. If the woman only comes, is the only one coming, only 15% of the kids will be uh, attending. And so what this shows us is the importance of a father figure or the importance of the man in the home. The importance of a dad, the importance of the male figure. Now, in saying that, in no way does it disparage women. You know, I preached a sermon uh, a couple of three months ago dealing uh, similar, with similar issues, but it's not the same sermon. Let me let you know this right now. And so what I want to do is, is I understand that women have their role and they have their place that God has put them in for the family. But... In the word of God, it is the man who God expects to be the leader in that home and to bring about a spiritual dimension in that family that will cause God's blessing and God's protection and fruitfulness. That survey went on to say that if neither the man, the dad, or the mother attend church, listen to this, that only 6% of those children, when they grow up, will attend church. And I kind of believe that's what's going on today in our society, and why so many people have dropped out of, of church is because mom and dad, somewhere along the line, have pulled back in their church attendance, either dad or mom. And you see the decline in people coming to church, and things aren't like what they used to be. Things are different than they used to be, and there are reasons for that that I want to talk about this morning. But you know, there's a song that's dear to my heart, and that I was as I was getting this this uh, message together and putting it uh, in its proper place and perspective as to how I wanted to preach it. Uh, that I wanted to play just a segment of that song, and it's by the Winans. And I want you to follow along with the words. Somebody put this together. I didn't. And uh, there's a, a few, uh, may, I'm not going to mention it because I don't want to distract you from the words of the song. So listen to the song if you guys have that ready. And uh, I want to talk about what they're talking about as they sing this song.
Somewhere we lost the score. It ain't like that anymore. And every time I hear that song, it just kind of brings me to a place of, 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 of sadness. When I think about how you and I, you know, the church in capital C, uh, has uh, lost the perspective of what was right and what was wrong and what we need to stand for as opposed to the complexities of, of, of this society and how tragic it is when the people of God become influenced and especially when children uh, can no longer look to their parents for the light as to what is good and what is wrong. And if it's not up, if, if we as mom and dad, as, as fathers and husbands can't uh, determine for our children how they should live and, and the things that they should or should not be involved in, then our society as we see today is, is, is going to continue to disassemble and to destruct simply because it's the people of God who are not doing their part, and specifically the men in the home and the men of God. The New York Times, and I'll get to my text in a moment, but the New York Times published an article entitled Sweeping Away Gender-Specific Toys and Labels. I'm an, I, I, I've experienced that. I saw that as I go to buy stuff for my granddaughter. Uh, I, I went in one day and said, well, where's the girls' department? Where's the young boys' department? They just wiped out all those signs. And we see that taking place in our society today. And as I was listening to this song, and we remember the day when boys grew up into men and little girls into women. And we're living in a time when it seems that society wants to remove that because of the transgender movement intended to confuse children about who they are as God's creation and what I look at it as being is a transgression uh, against uh, God's deliverance, God's purpose, and God's creation. There are those who want us to believe there's no difference between a man and a woman. But you see, there are stubborn facts that come through biology that refuse to go away no matter how hard you try. And they say that no matter what, Men and women are just different. 
because our brains are wired differently. Simple example, when women go to the bathroom, it becomes a social event. It's the more the merrier. You know, in my family, we're out uh, on this uh, one, one, one day we went out and uh, there were, people were waiting in line. You know, we were walking around and there was the men's room and the women's room. And the women's restroom line, it was outside in the open, had a huge line. The men, one guy just came out by himself. Why? Because men don't need any help. Boys and girls are different. You see it on the playground. You see it in school. How are they different? Boys, during games and sports, they choose sides for their team on the basis of ability. Girls choose sides on the basis of relationships. They don't care if this, this one's the better player. She's not my friend, so I ain't going to put her on my team. Boys could care less. They want the guy who's the strongest and the best. Boys and girls are different. You know, when boys are playing and one of the guys gets hurt, big deal. They just drag them off the field so the game doesn't stop, and they keep going. When a girl gets hurt on the field, oh, boo-boo, and they got a whole little um, culture of, of, of a meeting going on to help encourage and to help strength. And that's just the difference between boys and girls. We're just different. And you see this morning, our society needs godly men who can help other men who may not know Jesus Christ to become better fathers, better parents, uh, better husbands, uh, and it's upon you and I here today. That's why I said I'm uh, probably preaching to the choir. And there are, thank God for our godly men that we have here today. Give yourselves a great hand. Ladies, give them a great hand for the men we have here this morning. Godly men, godly fathers, godly husbands who are doing their job. And I'm aware that there are single parents here, and I understand there are single moms here who are doing the job of both the man and the father. God bless you for doing what you're doing. God has a special blessing for your life. In the book of Psalm, chapter 68 and verse 5, the psalmist says and writes, A father of the fatherless, a judge of the widow is God in his holy habitation. God is with you. God sees what you do, and he's going to honor you. You believe that this morning. But today, I just want to focus primarily on speaking to men about what the Word of God says. Uh, your role is in the family. This is a great discipleship sermon. But on Saturdays, unfortunately, a lot of men aren't involved. They work. They got other things going on. So I got you here today. Yeah. And, and, and so it'll be a good thing, believe me. It's going to be a good thing. The first thing I want to let you know, and you probably already know this, but man, God wants you to be a lover. He wants you to be a lover. Not a Latin lover, but a lover in that sense. You may be Latin, but that doesn't matter. I'm talking about the other kind of, of gigolo. <laughs> be a lover of your family. Love your family. Let's turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 5, and let's start with verse 21. It says there, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, and I'm focusing on husbands, so let's, let's concentrate on that. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with the water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his or their own body, 
but they feed and, and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect uh, her husband. So God wants you men to be a lover. Love your family, and I'm sure you do, but I want to talk about what kind of love it really is. You know, what, what the Word of God speaks to us about in Ephesians 5. Three times here in the scriptures we read, it says that a man is to love his wife. Husband, loves your, love your wives. Men ought to love their wives as their own body. And nevertheless, let each one of you in particular love his own wife, even as himself. So what the scripture is saying is that what our responsibility is. Now, I, I want to qualify because I know there may be some fathers who aren't in the home. You may be here today for whatever reason. This still applies to you and your responsibility. It, re, it responds to the father or the dad. It's your responsibility. And if you're a man here and uh, you're not married yet, Take notes, because if that's the case, one day it will, may apply to you uh, in your life. And so what scripture, the scripture tells us is that we have a responsibility to love our wives. How do we do that? As Christ loved the church. How did he love the church? He loved the church with a sacrificial, selfless kind of of love. We know that he loved us for God so loved the world that God gave his only begotten son for our sins and our iniquities that as we believe on Jesus Christ, uh, God's son, our sins would be forgiven. This is how much uh, God loves us and how Jesus gave his life and sacrificed uh, for our sins uh, to be forgiven. It is a sacrificial kind of love. That's how your love, man, husband, dad, father, is supposed to be. It's not the kind of love that we try to buy our family, you know, love for our family by giving them a bunch of things, and that means we're showing them that I love you and ignoring them the rest of the time and leaving them and, and not, you know, fulfilling the, the duties of a father or a husband. It doesn't mean just because you're able to do that, that's not what the love that Jesus was talking about. He's talking about a sacrificial love that goes beyond that kind of love. It's not a bargaining kind of love. You do this for me and I'll love you. It's not that kind of love. It's not a conditional kind of love that says, I love you if, but it's an unconditional, sacrificial kind of love. And I, I, I really feel this is the problem in today's families, in today's homes, that that aspect of sacrifice has gone by the wayside. And consequently, we see the results where families are being broken apart, marriages are falling apart, simply because this aspect of sacrifice, and it begins with the man. And, and, and ladies, I get it. Sometimes the man is just a plain jerk. Okay, I understand that. How many of you guys, we can be jerks? It's true. We can be jerks. But that should not, that should not make any difference when it comes to forgiveness or when it comes to loving the love of Jesus Christ in your relationship. Because when we learn sacrificial love, even for women, what it does is it begins to bring healing. It begins to bring a mending in whatever situation may be going on. This is why it's so critical today. Everybody's out for themselves. 
and nobody was wanting to sacrifice uh, for someone else and to show sacrificial love. Love isn't something you feel. Well, I don't feel love for them anymore. So what? So what? Love isn't something you feel. Love is something you do. It's something you do. Jesus Christ. We read in, in, in the Gospels that in the Garden of Gethsemane, I guarantee you, he did not feel like going to be crucified. He said, if at all, Father, let this pass from me. I don't have a good feeling about this. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And love is not a feeling, but it's something uh, that we decide to do. We decide to love our spouse, our wives. We decide, men, to love our children with a sacrificial love. Not only does the Bible say that the man is to love his family like Jesus loved the church, but in verse 28, it says to love them as you love your own bodies. And men, we love our own bodies. I know there's a silence here. But wives, you know about your man if you're married here and your man is in the home and he loves his own body. He buys the kind of snacks he likes. Don't care if you don't like them. I like them. He watches the program he likes. I don't care if you don't want to watch it. I want to watch it. He does his hobby that he likes, and I don't care if, if you don't like you know, uh, uh, hunting. Uh, I do. We know how to take care of our own bodies and clothe ourselves and do the things that we like. And what the Word of God is saying here, the way we spoil ourselves or look after ourselves, how much more are we supposed to look after our wives and our children sacrificially and love them the way we love ourselves, And especially spiritually, look after them, provide for them, and to make sure they are spiritually healthy. Remember that, that one statistic and survey I, I started off with that said that one, one of the six uh, uh, aspects of a healthy family is the spiritual health of that family. And that's our job, men. Dad, father, man. That's our responsibility. The number one concern it needs to be applied. As the Word of God says, we need to apply it. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 7, Likewise, you husbands, dads, fathers, men, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto your wife as the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers not be hindered. Well, number one, it says, dwell with them according to knowledge. That means you have to learn to understand your wife. And that takes work sometimes. Ladies, how many know it takes work to understand us? Some of, you, some, some of us have been married for a lot of years, and we still don't understand each other. I still can't figure out why he does that. I still can't figure out why she does that. Well, you don't just quit in that relationship loving them simply because you can't figure them out. The Bible says that dwell with them according to knowledge. Trying to gain understanding and uh, living with your wife with, and, and with your children. Let me put the children in there. That's your responsibility. It's not mine. Don't call the pastor. Pastor, I just don't understand why she's like this. Well, brother, I don't live with her. You do. So that's your job. I got my own issues I got to deal with. You see, Dad... Father, each of one 
of us is responsible to search for that understanding, to pray for God to give you understanding about your wife and your children, and especially your children. Because how many know that each one is distinct individually? Each of our kids, Ingo, each one is different in, in the family. You could have five people in the family, six, eight people, four people. They're all individually different. Whose responsibility is it to live with all of them in the house? It's your responsibility, my responsibility. Well, you know what? The, the, the kids, they're, they're, they're not, they're not, they're not uh, carrying their weight, you know? Uh, the, it's, it's everybody else's fault that my family's falling apart. No, it's not. It's yours. Amen. It's yours. It's the bottom line. And, and there may be some men that don't want to hear this because they think their wife is, is, is just never going to get it together. Well, that's your issue you've got to deal with. And you've got to find out how to correct that and how to make it right. That's what God's role is for us as men, as fathers, and as dads. We need to know how to positively relate to the members of our families. That means our wife and our kids. Don't just throw in the towel. Then it says to give them honor. You honor them. Pastor Dan preached an outstanding message a couple of Sundays ago, or was it last Sunday maybe, on honor. And uh, how he learned from his parents what honor was all about. And when he didn't show honor, he got smacked, coscoron, boom, smack. And that came from the home. And you see, when we as, as parents, and especially the dad, we need to rise up and, and show that word honor means courtesy. Be courteous, dad, to your wife, father. To the mother of your children, be courteous. That's what that word showing honor means. Be polite. How many know, guys, we can be impolite in our homes as dads, as fathers? How is that? Well, how about when you have guests over the house? How do you treat them as opposed to how you treat your wife or your husbands or your, your, your children? You know, you know they, get, they get the best seat in the house. You know, what can I get you? You serve them. You make sure they're comfortable. Make sure they're happy. Is everything okay? Can I get you something? And, boy, you're doing everything you can to make yourself look good and make sure your wife is on schedule to bring the dinner. But when the family, when the, when, when the guests are gone and we're back, hey, you! What's the matter with you kids? Honor is out the window. Politeness. Courtesy is gone. Sometimes we treat guests more courteously than we do our families. And it's sad. And then it says, as being heirs together of the grace of God. Now these are, are simple points that I just wanted to bring and, and refresh our minds with. Because, again, sometimes we get off track as men. And we, and we start to think, well, it's the mom's responsibility. The kids, you take care of them. You make sure they're, they're clothed or they're doing their homework and doing whatever they're supposed to do. Well, let me tell you something. I get it. You know, we share the task. And sometimes, the, you know, well, let me say this. Most of the times, the women are, more, are smarter than the men when it comes to arithmetic and things like that. But you know what? Don't throw in the towel. Do your job as a man, as husbands, dads. Be the uniter, heirs together of the grace of life, not a divider. Understand that God has put our family together. God has united us. He, he specifically designed the children that you have to be your children. Think about that. He didn't give those children to anybody else, Dad, Father. He gave them to you. What a privilege. What an honor that God has given us our children. <laughs> Heirs together of the grace of God. Now, and then it says, be a leader. That's what we need to do. Be a lover 
and be a leader, the spiritual leader of your family, as I mentioned, the one who sets the pace for your family. One of the main reasons we see so much destruction, so much tragedy in young people today and teenagers and young people in the streets is because dad, the father, the husband, has relinquished the leadership duties and the leadership role to TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. No longer are you aware of what they're doing. No longer are you at the forefront of leading their thought process or leading uh, their, their morality, but now someone is engaged with them. Your job, my job as a man, to, is to be the leader. Whether you're in the house or out of the house, Father, you still, as a Christian man, uh, need to be the leader in making sure those children uh, are understanding of the things of God. God placed that responsibility upon our lives as parents. And it means we need to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, as Ephesians 5 speaks about. We can't exercise authority in our family unless we are under God's authority, His spiritual leadership. It's our responsibility to yield to that and partner with uh, the Lord. I'm going to close with this as our worship team makes their way up this morning. The last thing I want to speak with you about is that fathers, husbands, we need to elevate our family. Lift them up. Exalt them before God. Don't complain about your wife. Don't complain about your children. Elevate them if you can. Elevate them. Speak to your wife about how to make it better. I like verse 25 through verse 27 in the book of Ephesians. It says, husbands, love your own. Everybody say own. Love your own wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Why? that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. So here we see that Jesus gave his life for you and I as people so that when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, as the Son of God, he will forgive our sins and lift us, lift us up to new heights to new levels of life that we never experienced before, a better future with, with our family, with our spouse, with our children as we partner with him. Jesus elevates the church, you and I, when we experience salvation. And it says that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That's what we're supposed to do as husbands, as fathers, to elevate our family, to grow in uh, their relationship with Jesus Christ, their spiritual gifts that they have. Pray about how God has gifted your children and what they can do to be used of God. Your wife, pray about what spiritual gift your wife might have uh, so that God can use her life. Don't hold them back from the things of God. Encourage them to get involved uh, in the things of God, in ministry, in serving others. In Ephesians 6, 4, it says, And you, fathers, do not provoke or your children to anger or to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. It means to cultivate, educate their minds, their morals, train them in the way of God. Proverbs 22, 6. Husband, dad, father, men, help us to make a difference in our church, in our society by fulfilling our 
responsibility to be a lover of our family sacrificially, to be a leader in our family, to guide them in the things of God and to lift them up before God that he would work miracles and that they would accomplish the will of God for their lives. Nothing better than to see our families accomplishing the will of God. I rejoice every time I see parents serving God and their children serving the Lord. Uh, yesterday, that was happening. That was so, so exciting because it means uh, we are doing what God wants us to do. And men, dads, fathers, I'm going to close with this today. One day, if you do, we do our job, our fulfill, our responsibility. One day you might receive a letter like this that I read about the other day. It goes like this. Dad, I want you to know I tested you a lot. Dad, I want you to know I did some things that you weren't happy with. I know I gave you some difficulties, but Dad, I want you to know, as I look back on it now, I want to thank you for how you raised me. Dad, I just want you to know that I thank you so much for being a real man in our family. I would love one day to get a letter. Wouldn't you, Dad, Father, like that? No matter how many things go wrong, no matter how, how, how long maybe our children have been away, I guarantee you, they will not forget. The Bible says when we train up our children in the way of the Lord, they will not depart from it. And one day, those seeds will begin to flourish. Men, fathers, husbands, it all starts in the family. It all starts at home because if our faith doesn't work at home it doesn't work at all it begins at home either our families will be built like a sand dune blown away by every wind of doctrine and every cultural change because we haven't fulfilled our responsibility as a Christian man or it will be like a sculpture shaped by God to fulfill God's purposes that our children would accomplish God's destiny for their lives as God created them to do. It's up to you and I this morning as we bow our heads before the Lord.